Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today in Rome. The main economic challenge for insurers today is that following 40 years of fiscal deficits, sovereign risks have deteriorated. As financial firms with long duration liabilities, insurers and pension funds need long duration assets, they have traditionally looked to government bonds as their core holdings to match liabilities. They now face the consequences of high and still rising government indebtedness. In such a context, governments need to take the necessary steps or to pursue their efforts to re-earn a practically risk-free status through credible fiscal consolidation plans. A second pressing issue for insurers' business model is the present low for long bond yields. This threat has several aspects. Lasting low and flattened rates for long bonds can put solvency pressure on those life insurers that have committed to delivering high returns for policyholders and that did not fully match their assets with their liabilities. Indeed, there is a risk that competition will lead insurers to try to reach for higher yields and not reduce sufficiently the return of annuity-type products offered. Therefore, business could shift to those who are most willing to take risks. One of the benefits of the Solvency II framework is to encourage the management of insurance companies to resist applying inappropriately high return practices. However, even if the industry does reduce its benefits appropriately, customers may be tempted to look elsewhere for higher yields, thus hurting insurance companies' revenues while operating costs are often more difficult to adjust. Secondly, insurers are prominent investors. As collectors of savings, and through their obligations to establish reserves to cover their commitments to policyholders, they are the largest non-bank institutional investors in Europe, with over 7 trillion 700 billion of assets under management at the end of 2011. That's 55% of the GDP of the European Union. Insurers invest in a broad range of asset classes, with two-thirds held in corporate and government bonds. They provide funding for activities and instruments on which European growth depends, like bank debt, covered bonds, and investment in large corporates. Furthermore, because of bank deleveraging, they are expected to increase their contribution to financing infrastructure projects, or NSMEs. The series of recent shocks on equity markets with the bursting of the international bubble in the internet bubble in 2000, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and their volatility have led them to scale back the percentage of shares in their assets. Currently, shares make up less than 5% of their total assets. Anticipation of solvency too may have contributed to this change because it reflects the same risk aversion. Charging equity holding at a marginal rate of 39% of regulatory capital compared with 12.5% for a five-year triple B corporate bond and 10.5% for a 10-year single A makes it very difficult. Thirdly, the specificity of insurance companies is to match their assets with the characteristics of their liabilities in order to reduce their exposure to market risks. Insurance companies invest the premiums collected from their customers as counterparts of their contracts in various assets to secure their capacity to face up to related liabilities in due time. As a consequence, insurers are investors who will look for assets that are consistent with the duration of those liabilities. While non-life insurers are more focused on short-dated assets, life insurers look 
for longer instruments, either debt or equity. Although they remain exposed to default risk, insurers can avoid exposure to market risks where they manage their assets and liabilities consistently. Indeed, most of their financial cash flows related to their assets, like reimbursement at maturity, coupons, and their liabilities, that is, premiums received, contractual contribution paid to those to the insurance policy holder, do not require market trading. They are most of the time not affected by financial market downturns and liquidity variations. In addition, as life insurers have a pre-funded business model, they are not subject to runs. This is a marked difference with the banking sector. In spite, of, in spite of this fundamental principle of asset and liabilities management matching, there is a risk, especially in the present low interest rate environment, that some insurers try to improve their performances and take advantage of the flexibility offered by financial markets by increasing their risk appetite and their exposure to credit risk. In addition, the management of assets and liabilities of portfolios related to some long-term pension-type products depends on the availability of assets of the same length as the liabilities. Solvency II and accounting standards is some insufficiently factor in insurance business model specificities, in my view. The most important target for any prudential regulation concerning insurance should be the quality of the matching between assets and liabilities. Unfortunately, it seems that Solvency II has not yet sufficiently factored in this fundamental feature. Although asset and liability mismatches do trigger additional capital charges, what the regulatory framework actually does is to evaluate separately the market risks I repeat, the market risks associated to assets and liabilities. Furthermore, this, I think, misguided principle is also embraced by accounting methods that value assets regardless of the liabilities those assets are supposed to protect. Although insurance companies match assets and liabilities, mark-to-market accounting standards unnecessarily oblige them to recognize ongoing valuation differences on both assets and liabilities, be it upwards as well as downwards. As a consequence, such a mark-to-market approach, which may arbitrarily reduce or increase paper profits, compounds the prudential volatility. Actually, in the current market conditions, mark-to-market net total assets, which are deemed to shoulder the risks of insurance companies may change in certain EU member states from quarter to quarter of up to 30%. Now, changing credit spreads on corporates or sovereigns primarily drives this volatility. Volatility can also arise due to fluctuations in interest rate movements. The main issues are focused on life insurance, which has long-term liabilities as opposed to non-life, which leads to mainly short-term liabilities. It is obvious that prudential and accounting systems, which ignore the long-term nature of the industry, would result in additional costs that would affect the conditions for financing Europe's economy, while making insurers pro-cyclical, even though their business models are fundamentally not pro-cyclical. In this respect, the work currently being carried out by the Commission and EUOPA to find ways to improve Solvency II so these unintended consequences can be avoided is a very positive step. There are also steps being taken by the International Accounting Standard Board to improve IFRS standards, which could also improve the way volatility is treated in insurance company financial reporting. It is important that these initiatives are successful 
and avoid showing artificially a volatile and insolvent European insurance industry. These initiatives should also take into account the very diverse functioning of national insurance markets in Europe. The calibration of Solvency II for infrastructure finance and securitization needs to be reconsidered. Insurance regulations do not specifically identify infrastructure investment, which is nevertheless a key area of investment and has very different risk characteristics than general corporate risks. Actually, they are much less risky. These types of investments also offer a particularly attractive duration for insurers' long liabilities and often include inflation-linked returns. It is therefore paradoxical that infrastructure investments should be particularly penalized at this stage by Solvency II, although they would improve Europe's competitiveness and growth. Currently, the calibration for all bonds, including infrastructure, are based on how extreme their market value changes have been in the past. This is exactly the wrong approach. As mentioned earlier, where insurers are exposed to default risk rather than market risks. It only makes sense to base capital calibrations on default experience instead of market movements. This matters because defaults are far lower than market movements and much more relevant, especially for highly rated long-term investments. The current calibrations, therefore, create inappropriate incentives for insurers to favor medium-term corporate bonds instead of longer-term infrastructure investments, despite the fact that they better fit their liabilities and that they are less risky. Lastly, since insurers match their assets in line with their liabilities, they are unable to offer direct credit financing suited to the specific requirement of enterprises, borrowers, unlike retail banking. In this context, while it is desirable to have Europe moving gradually towards an increase in market-based financing because of the inevitable reduction in the intermediation role played by banks, it will be essential to foster safe securitization operations in which insurance companies would be able to invest. The capital charges for the securitization operations subscribed by insurers must therefore be adjusted in line with the effective risk which these operations actually carry. Unfortunately, Solvency II regulation is considering a very severe treatment for securitization. Prime AAA securities would entail capital charges ranging from a minimum of 7% to a maximum of 42% for different durations, one to six years. This is higher than capital charges applying to equity holdings. In this context, it is again worth noting the enormous difference between actual defaults and market movements. A good example of high-quality securitizations are European residential mortgage-backed securities. Actual defaults on these between 2007 and 2011 were extremely low in Europe, 0.07%. I hope these important issues will soon be recognized and addressed by policymakers. Thank you for your attention.